Hello, everyone. Welcome to Talking Logistics, where we have conversations with thought leaders and newsmakers in the supply chain logistics industry. And, uh, you know, this week, uh, it's just going to be me and you guys talking about uh, revisiting transportation forecasting. Uh, now, this is a topic that I have written about and, and talked about, uh, you know, for a few years. And uh, it actually came back into my mind uh, over the past few weeks as I've been um, engaging in conversations with various uh, shippers and carriers and uh, attending and moderating uh, different panel sessions at, at conferences uh, the past few weeks. And, you know, the basic question is this, um, you know, a lot of companies engage in sales and operations planning and collaborative planning and forecasting where they, you know, look at, uh, uh, you know, point of sale data and, and they get input from a variety of different, uh, you know, folks within their company to create these demand forecasts and kind of for forward looking, you know, production uh, uh, forecasts. And they share that with their suppliers, with their manufacturing partners and, uh, and so on. Um, but they don't take it kind of the next step, which is taking that data, that information, and also create transportation forecasts. Um, you know, how much trucking capacity are we, are we going to need, um, you know, in support of this uh, anticipated demand and, and in support of the, you know, these production plans that we have in place. And, um, you know, the question then is, you know, why not? Why aren't more companies, you know, doing this? And there are really two you know, main reasons, you know, that I've heard and that I've seen as to why, you know, to date, this hasn't been in kind of a, a leading practice or a wide pre, uh, widespread practice. And the first one is, um, you know, lack of tools and, and uh, you know, pr uh, processes. Um, you know, if you look at, um, you know, traditional transportation management systems, you know, they really focus on, um, on orders you know, orders that are coming in through the ERP system. And that's what they use to uh, kind of generate their plans. Uh, obviously, it's very execution focused, you know, to get shipments out, you know, today, tomorrow, you know, in the coming week. And they're not really designed, um, you know, historically to take in, um, you know, demand forecast information or, or in, in that kind of information and translate that into capacity requirements. Um, you know, the only time that you really see any kind of transportation forecast put in place is really during the procurement uh, engagement, if, if you're putting out your, your network uh, to bid. And when you do that, um, you know, what shippers generally do is they look at historical data. They look at what they did last year by lane, and they use that as a starting point. And, and you know, based on, uh, you know, their, their, what they anticipate to do in the coming year, they tweak that up or down. Um, but, but there's a couple of problems with that. First, it's you know using a lot of historical data, uh, and secondly, it's it's really a snapshot in time. Um, so even though that forecast may be you know uh, as good as you can get it, um, it's really based on your current reality and and what your view of the future is at that point in time. And as we all know, things change you, you know over the course of time. Um, you know, you may pick up new customers, you may lose customers, you may open up a new distribution center somewhere. Um, that product that you thought was going to be a hot seller turns out to be a dud. Uh, and one that you thought was, uh, didn't have much, um, you know, uh, uh, anticipation for, it turns out to be a hot seller. So, um, you know, the variety, the reality is that, you know, the, the, the volume forecast, um, and your, you know, the transportation capacity uh, requirements that you put together for a transportation bid um, really becomes outdated, you know, relatively quickly because, you know, things change, you know, during the process. The other, um, you know, reason that um, uh, this hasn't really become a, a standard practice and what I hear a lot about it, you know, from the carrier side is, you know, carriers have relatively narrow uh, planning windows. So, um, you know, they don't know where their truck is going to be um, you, you know, a month from now, uh, let alone three weeks from now, and sometimes not even two weeks from now. Um, you know, for them, it, it's kind of the classic, you know, bird in hand. You know, am, am I going to, um, you, you know, uh, assign one of my assets, one of my trucks to a load that I know is a sure thing that uh, I can see in the system today? Or, you know, do I, um, you know, plan around maybe having a load a month from now because, you um, um, you know, one of my shipper clients, you know, thinks that, um, you know, they may need an extra load, you know, a month from now. So, uh, you know, that's always been one of the challenges is that, um, 
you know, how much forward visibility can carriers really use and how do they use that? And, and then related to that, you know, if, if um, uh, only one or two shippers or relatively few shippers are providing a carrier with forward visibility to capacity requirements, well, there's limited value there because, you know, obviously a carrier uh, works with many shippers and they have to balance their network across all the different requirements that they're getting. So if, if, it's, if that kind of information is only coming from, you know, again, relatively few shippers, um, there's only so much they can do with that uh, information. And, um, and just the fact that there's, you know, a lack of kind of standards uh, in, in, in reporting this information, you know, that also creates some challenges on the carrier side. If that information is coming in different formats, um, via different mediums, you know, it becomes difficult to kind of integrate that on their end, um, you know, to, to make that useful, you know, for their processes. So those are the two kind of main, you know, challenges or roadblocks that I've historically seen and heard from both shippers and carriers in terms of, um, of you know, being able to do transportation forecasting more effectively and being able to, you know, really leverage it uh, on, a, on an ongoing basis. So the question is, you know, what's changed? Because I really think um, that, uh, you know, the tide is beginning to change in this area and that we're going to start seeing both shippers and carriers really start paying more attention to this and, and kind of the needle start moving on this. So I just want to highlight some of the things that I think that have changed. The first one is that, you know, we're seeing the emergence of technology solutions in this area. Uh, you know, one of the, uh, you know, first solutions that I really saw um, focus on transportation forecasting was from uh, Terra Technologies. Uh, this was maybe going back two or three years ago. I actually wrote a, a blog posting uh, about it. Um, and, and they really, you know, took a very focused um, uh, approach to this, uh, bringing in, you know, the demand planning information, point of sale data information, and, and through the use of technology, really then converting that and trying to automate the process of, of taking that information and translating that into transportation capacity uh, requirements. And, uh, you know, so, so they were one of the first and, and they continue to kind of innovate uh, on that front. And then just this week, I was at the Manhattan Associates uh, user conference and I attended, um, you know, their update on the transportation lifecycle management solution. And one of the things that I learned was that in their latest release, they had they released a new functionality that they call carrier uh, forecasting. And the other, the plan really is to you know provide a capability for shippers to provide their carriers with uh, visibility two to four weeks out to any um, uh, uh, changes to their capacity requirements. Again, within that relatively narrow um, you know window of two to four weeks out. And, and the goal is not really to provide the carriers with, you know, a dump of, you know, here are all our lanes and how, what we see our, our capacity requirements being across every lane that we do. But it's really highlighting, you know, those lanes for that particular carrier where the deviation from their original plan is significant enough for the carrier to know. So, for example, if, if uh, you know, during the procurement bid and, and, and what the expectations were set early on, whether you're going to have four loads for, per week going from Boston to Chicago, and now you anticipate that changing instead of four loads per week, changing to perhaps seven or eight loads a week in, in a month's time, because maybe you're running a promotion, or maybe you, you just picked up a new customer and they're going to be ramping up uh, the, their purchase of, the, of a product, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, you know, Having the ability to then communicate that uh, via the TMS uh, to your carriers, again, that, that changes, you know, the, those significant changes in um, your requirements um, you know, to carriers. So again, um, we're seeing, you know, technology uh, being uh, uh, applied here. Uh, I suspect and, and expect to see uh, more TMS providers and other technology providers uh, kind of take a second look at a more focused uh, look on enabling these types of capabilities like Terra and, and Manhattan are currently doing and a few others uh, as well. Uh, the second thing that's changed is that, you know, shippers are becoming uh, much more uh, concerned than ever about, uh, you know, capacity. Um, you know, when they look at things like hours of service, uh, which, you know, the new rules, uh, unless something, um, you know, happens with the, uh, the ruling, uh, the new rules are going to be coming into effect July 1st. Um, with CSA um, and, and the safety uh, uh, measurement system and, you know, what's that what that's doing to, 
you know, the availability of, you know, carriers to hire and retain drivers and so forth, uh, you know, shippers are becoming much, much more concerned about capacity. And, you know, the way I like to say it is that, you know, historically, uh, shippers have really looked at transportation almost as a, uh, as an infinite capacity, uh, you know, an infinite resource, I should say. And, uh, you know, there will always be a truck, you know, to pick up our load. And, and in some ways, that's true. Um, uh, the, the reality is, though, that you may not pay what you want to pay for that load um, because, uh, uh, you know, some some truck will pick it up, but it's going to be for a rate that's going to be, uh, you know, two to three times more than probably what you want to pay. And secondly, the carrier that picks up that load uh, is not going to be your preferred carrier or the number two or three or four, or maybe even fifth carrier on your list. It may be from a carrier that, you know, in an ideal where you probably wouldn't be doing business with. Um, so the, the bottom line is that shippers are becoming you know, kind of taking a different perspective on capacity, you know, not assuming anymore that it's an infinite resource and really thinking about how can we manage capacity, um, uh, you know, more more intelligently? How can we work with our carriers uh, to ensure that, um, you know, as our capacity needs change, that they're able to support us, um, that we're able to, you know, lock in capacity at a rate that makes sense for both us and, and the carrier. Uh, and particularly with carriers that we've got, you know, trusting relationships with, um, you, you know, they've got good service and good quality records, um, you know, good safety records. So, um, uh, again, so I think from the shippers front, I think there's, re there's um, a stronger focus this, these days on um, smarter and more collaborative uh, approaches to capacity uh, management. Uh, and finally, the other thing that's changed and kind of related to that, and, and maybe this isn't really hasn't changed because that carriers have been saying this for, uh, you know, for a long time, but carriers really want to have ongoing visibility to their shippers, uh, you know, requirements and business, and they really want to engage in ongoing conversations with their with their shipper uh, partners, and they want to be viewed as partners, right? They want to be able to have ongoing conversation and visibility to to be part of the solution, right? So so that you know, they have a voice as the shippers' requirements are changing or some of their initiatives that may, they may be launching. They want to have a seat at that table to be able to propose solutions or creative ways to help, you know, help the shipper meet its, its objectives. And certainly, you know, um, when you look at transportation, you know, forecasting um, and the ability to do that, you know, that becomes a good plant platform to be able to start engaging in these types of conversations. Because if the carrier has visibility, to you know, uh, volume changes requirements. You know that that are you know two, three, four weeks down the road. Um, if they have some visibility to you know changes in the shippers network uh, and and so forth. Again, that gives a carrier an opportunity to take that into perspective within their network, within their business. You know how valuable is this shipper uh, to their uh, to their overall business, and you know what are the kind of things that they can do and propose to the shipper. Uh, again, to maintain a strong relationship with them, and you know, again, from the carrier standpoint, to perhaps increase their their spend with them, you know, their 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 level, you know, for the shipper to increase their spend with them, and uh, again, to be a more strategic partner with the with the shipper. So those those are the things that are that are really uh, I see changing uh, in, in the marketplace, uh, and that's happening that that I believe are is going to uh, create some momentum behind um, transportation forecasting becoming uh, a more common practice out in the industry. So what are the benefits? You know, so, uh, you know, if you see what's happening out there um, uh, and you say, okay, that if we start doing this more, you know, what kind of benefits can we expect? And, and I see the benefits falling in two buckets based on, um, or at least two buckets, uh, you know, based on some case studies that I've seen and in, in, in conversations I've had with folks. The first one is you're going to reduce the amount of, you know, last minute, you know, spot buys of, of, of transportation capacity, particularly for promotions, um, which has been an area that a lot of, particularly CPG manufacturers, always struggle with. Uh, and, and secondly, is, uh, you know, if you've got more forward visibility in terms of your transportation requirements and capacity requirements, and you're able to have that data in front of you, um, you might be able then to do some smarter planning in terms of mode shifts. Uh, so instead of, instead of uh, uh, sending everything via truck, if you've got more lead time and more visibility into your requirements, you might be able to, uh, you know, plan more effectively in terms of moving some of the, the those future shipments via rail or intermodal. Again, you know, be able to, uh, you know, save some money on that front. 
Um, if you go back to the um, uh, you know the promotions front, the, the case study that comes to mind is one that I wrote about you know several years ago, and it was about with Unilever. And um, you know Unilever at the time you know was struggling because uh, transportation the transportation group was the last group to find out about you know promotions product promotions. Um, so what would happen is that you know a product group would uh, launch a promotion, um, didn't tell transportation at the 11th hour. Transportation would have to you know um, uh, find some extra capacity to support um, you know those promotions, and of course you know finding capacity at the 11th hour tends to be expensive. Uh, to make matters worse, you know none of the product groups would talk to each other, so sometimes you know you would have multiple product promotions hitting at the same time, and that will make things even more challenging you know, for the transportation group. So what they did at the time was they actually um, assigned one of their transportation people access to the system that the product managers would use to plan promotions. And that transportation person had visibility across all the product lines around planned promotions, when they were going to get executed, what the planned uh, or the expected lift was going to be. And then that uh, transportation person then converted that information into into transportation capacity requirements. Now, you know, the process wasn't automated, you know, uh, uh, you know, based, based on my understanding, they were kind of using a spreadsheet and their own calculations to do this. But again, the visibility that they had now to these promotions and the ability that they were able to now pre-plan for these uplifts in, uh, in transportation capacity saved them a lot of money. Uh, and in fact, uh, if I remember the case study correctly, you know, one of the examples that they showed was they had five promotions that hit at the same time. Uh, which ended up uh, driving a 20% lift in, in volume, yet, you know, they were able to effectively execute that and, and not really, um, you know, uh, and save money because they were able to lock in capacity four weeks in advance. Um, what they were able to do was for that uplift, uh, they worked with some of their uh, carrier partners to secure that some dedicated capacity for that two or three week period when they were running those promotions. So again, a key area uh, there in terms of, of um, you know, managing, um, you know, uh, uplifts in, you know, volume based either for promotions or perhaps seasonal uh, uplifts, uh, perhaps uplifts due to, you know, a new customer coming into the network uh, and so forth. So again, having that visibility, being able to plan for it and then being able to work with your carriers more effectively, I think is a, is a key area uh, there. So finally, what, what are the next steps here? Uh, as I think about it in terms of making this a, uh, uh, again, a more standard uh, leading practice. You know, number one, I think that this has to, this whole process has to be integrated with SNOP and, and, and CPFR, collaborative planning and forecasting processes. Um, you know, I think if you make it, you know, a lot of companies already have SNOP and CPFR in place. Um, you know, this piece needs to be integrated as, as part of, of that. And in fact, one of the uh, case studies that I came across uh, many years ago was Canadian Tire, where they were actually uh, doing this. Uh, they would create these 26-week uh, rolling forecasts uh, that they would share, uh, you know, for for, you know, for demand um, uh, demand forecasts and production forecasts, and they would share that information with their again suppliers and manufacturing partners. Um, but they would also convert that into logistics uh, requirements, both transportation capacity requirements as well as resource requirements over at, the, at their uh, distribution centers and share that as well. And they would always firm up, um, you know, three weeks out what the requirements were. Uh, so again, they had a, a nice process there at the time of integrating this within their overall, you know, SNOP, CPFR, uh, you know, type of planning. You know, at the time they admitted that, you know, even though they were sharing this information with a lot of their carriers, um, again, um, there was only so much their carriers can do and, and it really wasn't driving a lot of benefit at the time with trucking in particular. Uh, you know, they were hoping that over time that that would um, you know become more of a standard practice with with other shippers and that they would you know um, ultimately see benefit there. Where they were seeing benefits actually was on the on the barge side because they were able to. Um, there was only a limited amount of of uh, barge um, uh, capacity and they had certain schedules that they had to uh, um, and those were scheduled types of um, uh, resources. Uh, so by having that forward visibility, they were able to lock in capacity ahead of time. Uh, so certainly on certain modes of transportation, they were seeing benefits uh, uh, there. Uh, secondly, I, we need to see continued innovation on the technology front. Like I mentioned, we're, we're already seeing that in play. Um, I expect you know other transportation and, and logistics uh, technology providers to 
continue to innovate and enhance their capabilities in this area. And not only for the shippers, I think it's also very important that technology solutions come and play for the carriers as well. Um, because I think, you know, for, uh, for this to really provide value, it really needs to provide value for both ends, both shippers and carriers. And then the question becomes, well, how can, if, care, if this becomes standard practice and all shippers are providing this type, type of information to carriers, how can carriers use this? And obviously, they're going to need technology solutions at their end to be able to input this information um, and, and integrate it with their operating systems and their other uh, uh, tools that they use, uh, again, to you know, make the most sense out of the information as they try to balance their network, you know, keep their yield and, and asset utilization as high as possible, so on and so forth. So again, technology not only for the shippers, but the carriers are also going to need some technology to take advantage of, the, of this, uh, you know, forward visibility to transportation capacity requirements. And then finally, yeah, and related, you know, we need to develop some standard, you know, processes here, both in how to, uh, you know, how companies can calculate this information. Because again, you know, it may sound kind of trivial to, uh, you know, hey, let's take this demand forecast and production forecast and point of sale data and just just calculate, um, you know, uh, uh, capacity requirements, transportation capacity requirements, but it's really not that straightforward and not that simple. Um, so, you know, being able to, uh, you know, define some processes and methodologies to do that effectively, I think it's going to be important. And then from a reporting standpoint, you know, being able to report this information in a standard way uh, is, is what's ultimately going to drive adoption and usefulness of this. Like I mentioned earlier, you know, if, if shippers are, are producing uh, you know, these forecasts and, and sharing this information with carriers in their own formats and carriers have to deal with, you know, 500 different formats and, and things like that, you know, there's going to be friction in the system then to, to really truly get value out of this. So, you know, we need some standards, you know, developed here to, you know, fully make this a, a reality. So those are my, uh, you know, two cents on, on this topic. Um, I hope you uh, found it useful and, and I don't know if, you, if any of you have any questions, uh, but certainly if, if you do, um, you can go to talkinglogistics.com uh, if you're watching this um, uh, on demand and post a question on the um, uh, on the on the uh, on the posting there, and I'll certainly be happy to you know answer it or um, you know we can start a conversation uh, on the website as well. So again, thank you very much for uh, joining me today. Um, you know, in future weeks, as we have in, in the past weeks, we'll have we'll continue to have some great um, you know guests on the program, uh, thought leaders and newsmakers in the industry. Um, you know, really give you the opportunity to ask questions and engage, um, you know, with these thought leaders um, as we continue to explore some of the leading trends and opportunities in the supply chain logistics industry. So again, thank you for joining me and I look forward to seeing you in a future episode of Talking Logistics. Have a great day.